Thanks, Aaron. Some of you may wonder what's, what version that was. That was the version that made sense to us. So it's a couple of different versions, and then we got rid of the thighs and turned them into your. You might wonder why we did that. Some of you who are very literal, you might say, oh, but it says don't change any word in the Bible. Not changing it, you got to keep the meaning. you got to make it make sense in your mind and in your heart. One of the first things I learned in school, which was very useful, was when you read something, turn it into your own words so it makes sense in your head. And the texts actually are about a message. The gospel is a heart message if it's a message at all. The words are important, but the feelings that are embodied in those words are what actually grabs us and keeps us. Sometimes some of us, we, we want to shut our emotions down. We want to put them in a box and we say, no, it's not about your feelings. You have to just choose. And, and that is true. You do have to choose. But if you ignore your feelings, first of all, you can't because it's like um, putting water in your hands. You try to hold all the water and it just kind of leaks out in the places you really don't want it to come out at. Your emotions are just like that. When you put them away and you hide them, they just leak out some other way. And in a way, you don't intend. So the best thing to do with your feelings is to admit that you have them and come to terms with the fact that they are not always what you might consider good. They might be bad, but at the end of the day, they're just feelings. And just like you cast all your cares on God, cast all your feelings on God. He wants them. He wants them too. He can manage them, and he can keep them from leaking out at the wrong time, and if they do leak out, he knows how to catch them. And I say that because I speak from my own experience of really just wanting to do the right thing all the time and wanting to keep my emotions at bay. And one of the things that God had to tell me is he's like, I want your mind. That's great. I made it. He says, but I really need your heart. And the gospel is all about your heart. We can fill our mind up with data, and we can be convicted that we know the right answer. But the problem is, our heart is like, yeah, that's great, <laughs> but that's not what I want to do. And that's the struggle. But we, I think, are, are sometimes like the fool in Psalms 53. We don't ask God to help us. We act like the fool. Well, I don't say I act like. I didn't say we were. I said we sometimes are like the fool in Psalms 53 who says there is no God. And he continues and goes out and does a bunch of evil things. We are like that. If you read the text, turn with me to Psalms 53. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. And it says in verse 2, though, God looks down from heaven on the children of men, or you might say humanity, to see if there's anyone who understands, who seeks God. Now, understand that the word to understand, some versions say, to see if there's anyone who is wise, comma, but there's no comma in the text, who seeks God. So someone who is wise is someone who seeks God. Those are the same thing. And it, but he says, he looks to see if there is anyone who's wise and seeks God. But, and then it says, every one of them has turned aside. It means no one is looking up to God. No one is looking up and saying, hey, 
There's a bunch of stuff that's wrong. And you need to fix it. <laughs> Instead, they've all turned in other directions. And it says, every one of them has turned aside. And they have together become corrupt. If you think of the path being straight and narrow and corrupt, literally meaning turning the wrong direction. Instead of them going straight, looking ahead, they've looked away and their bodies have gone the direction they're looking, all different directions. Have any of you guys ever tried to walk um, a beam? Anybody ever tried to walk a beam? Or just the curb outside and you just try to stay on that curb? Have you noticed if you look at your feet, you always fall off? Have you noticed if somebody catches your attention, you fall off? But if you actually look straight ahead at a point and you just walk, you can stay on the beam. That's why he says no one calls on him because if you're looking up, you're looking up and straight ahead and you stay on the straight and narrow. And it goes on. It talks about the workers of iniquity. They have no knowledge. And he talks about the awful things that happen in verse 4. four. And these people with no knowledge, they eat up my people as they eat as if they were eating bread. And you might add at the end of verse 4, and they do not call upon God. Because that's what it says. And it says, and do not call upon God. Well, the workers of iniquity are not How about this? The workers of iniquity are not going to call on God because they're not wise. <laughs> it's not what they do. So who's supposed to call on God? The people who know God. But they are being eaten up as bread, but they're not calling on their God. And it says in verse 5, there they are in great fear where there's no, no fear was, or basically where they should not be afraid. For God has scattered the bones of him who encamps against you. You being God has put them, the wicked, to shame. We don't call on God and we know God. And so we are afraid of things that we don't need to be afraid of. We don't need to be of the terror, afraid of the terror that walks by night, nor all of the evil things that happen, the pestilence. You remember the text? Don't be afraid of those things because God has scattered your enemies. Call on him. David, it says this is a psalm of David. It says at the end, it says, in verse 6, oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When God brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. If we would call on our God, we would rejoice because we would know that we are saved. Not we're about to be saved. Not he's going to save us, but we are saved. You might get thrown in the fire. You might get thrown in the lion's den. You probably will be thrown in your own lion's den and your own fiery furnace. And sometimes you may have actually chosen to walk into it. But remember, call on your God. If you turned aside for a minute, if you turned aside for an hour, look back up because he's right there. Some people may say, well, why? Why? Because he can't help it. When we look, let's look at Psalms 123. Psalms 123 says, To you I lift up my eyes. There's a bunch of other psalms, but this is the one I picked.
Unto you I lift up my eyes, O oh, you who dwell in the heavens. Another text says, O oh, you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of a servant look to the hand of their master, and my favorite, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of their mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he be gracious to us. And we look and we look and you think of the parable that Jesus tells about the unrighteous judge. And there's a widow and she comes to him day after day. And he says, oh my goodness, let me give her what she's asking so she will leave me alone. But God is not an unjust judge. He's a righteous judge. In fact, he says he is love. And in Jeremiah 31, 20, it captures the feeling God is talking. And he's talking about Ephraim. And if you know anything about Ephraim, Ephraim just couldn't get it right. He was one of the sons of Joseph. And he, had, he, he grew and he became large. And he turned away as a whole group of people. They turned away from God so badly that God gave them what they asked for. And he says of them, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he my darling child? For as often as I spoke against him, I remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him, and I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. The feeling of yearning, the feelings that don't make sense when somebody has done something wrong, the feelings that you get that you can't control. God says, my heart yearns for someone who has turned away from me and keeps turning away from me. And I remember you still. That's Jeremiah 31, 20. But my favorite is Song of Songs. And it's just a piece of it. I actually like the whole section, but in Song of Songs 6 5, the beloved, the husband is talking. And there's this piece of it that's just so moving to me. And it says, Turn your eyes from me, they overwhelm me. When you and I lift up our eyes to God before his throne, and it says we can go boldly to his throne of grace. When we turn to his grace, you know what he says? He says, turn your eyes from me. I'm overwhelmed. We come afraid, and God says, when you just look up to me, I can't turn away from you. I'm overwhelmed by your love. I'm overwhelmed by you. You're beautiful. He says, I know every hair on your head. And it's like to me a flowing hair. Beautiful. And we look, and we're too busy looking down at our dirty feet and our kinky hair and our pimple-marked face. And he says, I see your eyes, and I'm overwhelmed my love for you. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's a love that starts before you were born. Before you were, I knew all of your parts. And I love you now. And he says, I will remember you till your gray hairs. And after you were gone, you're never gone from my mind because he's the God of the living and not the dead. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who to God are alive because he knows he has saved them for eternity. So for you, he always remembers you from before you are till after you're in the grave. Because in your mind, he's alive because he's going to recreate you perfect. 
I've loved you with an everlasting love. And he says, but I see that you're suffering. He says in Isaiah 59, but I see. He says, he looked and he saw that truth had fallen in the street. He saw there was no justice. He saw, he heard your cries. He hears my cries. And he saw your eyes and he was overwhelmed. And he looked, but there was no one to help you. No one interceded on your behalf. Do you feel like that? There's no one there. But he did. He's there. And he looked and he says, you know what? I got to do this myself. And he says, through his own arm, he brought salvation. His own righteousness is saying him. Because remember, he was looking and he couldn't find anyone. So he had to do it himself. Hebrews 10.5 says, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you made for me. You prepared for me. And we know that, or we believe and we are convinced that Christ was the fullness of the Godhead. So God prepared a body, filled himself up with this body, and he came, and it says, For he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Give me translation. He sent himself to be with you, to save you. He says, I've come. It is written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, my God. What? To loose the bonds of oppression. To set the captives free. To give sight to the blind. To give you peace. He says when he comes, he says, I might have to turn to this one. John 14. I talk about the cries of our hearts and the yearning. God's heart yearns for us. He did all this because he yearned for us. He was too far away in heaven. He had to come down. He had to make a body. He had to come walk with us. And in John 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That's what he says. But he also says, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I will send you a comforter. He says, I will be with you even unto the end of the age. And he says, and I leave my peace with you, not as the world gives peace. So all the things that your heart is looking for, presence, joy, peace, healing. He says, I saw that you weren't getting any of that. He says, I saw when you looked up at me, I couldn't resist and I had to come down. So I came down and now I am here. You don't see me, but my Holy Spirit, which I sent, I sent to you individually. You can hear me talk and whisper in your ear. You can remember I'm here. Sometimes, he says, I know, I had to send the Holy Spirit so I could be with all of you all at once. He says, so sometimes I sit down on someone next to you's heart, and I enter in, and they give you a hug, and that's me hugging you. That's me. And he says, but there comes a day when I myself am going to wipe away all your tears. There's a day when I myself am going to sit next to you. And there's a day when I myself, we're going to walk through heaven together. He says, and then we're going to walk on this earth together. And we're going to talk about all those questions you thought were important and now you don't care about them anymore. <laughs> we're going to talk about that. Because I want you to know me like you've never known me before. And guess what? You're going to know me so well after this journey that when you get to heaven and when I recreate the earth, you're going to be teaching all of the unfallen worlds about me. You have a purpose. You have a plan. He says, and I love you. My heart yearns for you. 
I ask you now, it says, I ask that one thing I ask of you today is to be wise. Seek after God. He already yearns for you. You wonder if he loves you. Oh, he's obsessed with you. Seek after God. Seek to know him in every way that you can. And you will be wise. Let's pray. My God in heaven, our God, we want to be wise. We turn our eyes toward you. We come to your throne of grace. Bless us with your presence. Bless us with more of your presence. Fill our hearts. And those of us who aren't sure, walk with those who are unsure that they might get to know you and choose you. Grant them peace that passes understanding. Let your loving kindness draw them more and more and make us channels of blessing. This I pray in the faith of your son. Amen.